I am Heidi Benjaminson, your host of Confidence Coaching, a podcast for mothers who want to stay calm, anchored, and like how they show up in the world. Life isn't a spectator sport. Success comes to those who show up every day with a pocket full of courage, grit, and a little sparkle. I'm glad you're here. Hello, hello. Welcome to episode 186, Understanding Your Nervous System. I'm glad you're here. How are you doing? I hope you're having a great summer. I can't believe this year is half over, y'all. I've been making goals for what I want to get done in the next three months and six months. If I make a plan, it gets done. In the next couple weeks, you'll be able to buy a self-study, inexpensive course to help you get ready to take your child to college. I'm excited to release it, and then this fall, I will have a six to eight week support group for mothers who just took their children to college. We will meet weekly via Zoom for support, teaching, and coaching, so look for signups for this, this late August, maybe early September. These are dreams come true for me. I've known that since experiencing these milestones with my children and having the tools I have, I've known I have to help as many mothers as possible as they are going through this life-changing season as well. It's going to be fantastic. So be sure you're on my email list or follow me on social media. For the last 18 to 24 months, I've been intensely studying and learning about our nervous system, how to regulate our emotions, how to recognize when someone else is or isn't regulated, and how mindset and cognitive tools work within the nervous system, or more specifically, when we need mindset and when we need body awareness or emotional releasing and regulating tools. Because the answer isn't always, and usually it isn't to just change what you're thinking. I've completed two certification courses, read numerous books by David Porges, the founder of the polyvagal theory, read many by Deb Dana, like the book Anchored, which explains the nervous system and how to return to safety and connection. It's been an incredibly eye-opening study, and the additional tools have enhanced my own personal framework of stay in our lane and knowing how our lane, our body and brain influence other people in their lane. And more importantly, how to stay out of someone else's lane. It has changed completely how I relate to my kids, to others. When I can see what nervous system state or color, as I'll teach you, another person is in, I know the most beneficial way to connect and relate and communicate to meet both of our needs. Now, I'm going to be teaching you all of this and incorporating the basics into more episodes. Please stay with me and learn the basics in today's episode and then more to come. I promise you this insight will change how comfortable you feel in any emotion, in the high stress of life or the low depressions of life. This is all a manifestation that our nervous system is working to protect us and working just right. So here are the basics using examples for us mothers of teenagers. Everyone who is alive, everyone has a nervous system. Our nervous system is made up of our brain, our spinal cord, and a series of millions of nerves that extend through our body, relaying information from any part of our body back up to our brain. The nervous system is basically how our body communicates back to our brain. If you've heard of the vagus nerve, this is the series of nerves that wander through our body to control our body or regulate how we respond to the world and stay alive. The nervous system is like the background software program that's always running in our body automatically. I'm talking here mainly about the autonomic nervous system. And the number one goal of this system is survival. It is working to keep us alive and that's it. Our nervous system regulates our heartbeat and digestion. Our nervous system began to be developed and imprinting memories and cues 
before we were even born. It began development in utero, so our mother's emotional state and the stresses possibly in her life when she was pregnant with us were making imprints on our nervous system even at that time. Our nervous system remembers any early childhood stresses or traumas, even if we don't consciously remember those things. So if we have a high ACE score, ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, our nervous system has imprints of these traumas and can recall states of danger, even if we have no conscious memories of those events. So our nervous system is like a built-in radar detector or surveillance system that's always looking for cues to determine only two things. Are we safe or are we in danger? That's its only job. Our nervous system uses the outward facing senses like vision and smell, as well as internal senses of our well being. It looks for these cues in three places. First, it looks to the environment and assesses where we are and who is with us. Second, Our nervous system looks inside our body, which is called interoception. So our nervous system is always sensing how we feel. And third, our nervous system looks relationally. It picks up cues from other people. I talk about some of these in terms of our channel of influence between my lane and someone else's lane. These relational cues that our nervous system picks up on could be maybe someone smiling or frowning, if someone makes eye contact or not body language, and much more. I remember years ago hearing soldiers returning from war recounting a situation where they came upon a big group of children, and the soldier's commander told them to lower their weapons and for everyone to smile. He was telling his soldiers to send a cue of safety to the nervous system of the children. Now, we don't know if the children could pick up on that cue, and sometimes the cues are wrong, but our body is constantly and subconsciously picking up on the cues and making decisions of safety or danger from them. All of this is happening without our thinking or the prefrontal cortex working. So our body conserves energy by having the survival software running in the background. What happens as our nervous system is taking in cues, the surveillance system then assigns us a nervous system state or assigns us to a color as I teach it. I'll talk more about each state and color in a moment. The state or color we are in then determines how we feel, how we respond, how we think and process or don't process a situation. It's really important to learn how our unique and individual nervous systems respond just automatically. Now, here's the problem about this survival software or radar detector. It usually isn't accurate. It's like a smoke detector in a kitchen that only has two settings, on or off. And when it goes off, it senses danger and reacts as if the entire house is on fire and you need to run for your life when in fact, most of the time, we've just burnt toast. So if we aren't paying attention to the state of our nervous system, we could always be calling the fire department when there really is no danger. I've learned it's important for me to recognize how much my children uniquely respond and for me to not mirror or respond back to their first nervous system response. Some of my kids quickly assess dangers and others don't quickly assess dangers. Now, before we talk about each state, that we're assigned to, it's important to also know our nervous system doesn't distinguish between the past or the present. This is where we see past experiences of danger can still trigger us to be alarmed today, even when there is no danger. Almost two decades ago, my husband was laid off for a job because his work was closing, and I remember him calling me in the afternoon and telling me, We had three children under four years old, and it was stressful for a few months. My nervous system remembers this. I can still be triggered just mildly when he calls, even though that hasn't happened again since then, and I have no evidence that it's happening now. Or a late night phone ringing can trigger my nervous system to remember other late night emergency calls. Our nervous system is just trying to protect us and keep us away from danger. 
Now, the good news is our nervous system is always learning and updating the software. So even though it remembers past events, now that we know how it works and we know default or unconscious responses we might have, we can manage our reactions and more quickly assess the burnt toast and stay calm. Let's talk about the states of our nervous system, because this is the piece that we're going to dive into in more future episodes, especially so we can handle the separation anxieties as our children leave for college and more. If our nervous system senses safety, it's going to assign us to a green state. In the polyvagal theory, they call this the ventral vagal zone. This is a zone of resilience, a zone of connection and calm. This is also referred to as maybe a window of tolerance. In this zone, which I just call the green zone, we feel safe and calm. This is a zone of connection and curiosity. It's our social zone. We feel good in this zone. We can be compassionate here. We aren't trying to defend ourselves so we can get to know other people in this zone. Here, we can regulate our emotions. It's like coming back to a comfortable home. It's important to point out that this is the only zone or state where our thinking brain, our prefrontal cortex is online and working. This is the state where we can take in new information, compare it to other information, and make accurate judgments about people and situations. Now, you would think our nervous system would want us to be in this zone most of the time. But remember, our nervous system is fairly inaccurate and senses danger and first assigns us to a zone or a color that many times just isn't really necessary. That's why we want to know these zones. I really want to be aware when I'm thinking my best and when I'm not thinking my best. If our nervous system senses danger, it will activate the sympathetic nervous system and we will go into fight or flight. Our nervous system activates our heart to beat faster. It mobilizes us so we can fight off attacks or run for our lives. This is why we can sense energy flowing. Now, I call this the red zone. In this hyper-aroused state, we are stressed. We're anxious and overwhelmed. We may always be busy. This is where perfectionism and hypervigilance live. Our thinking brain has gone offline and we have much less access to the communication centers of our brain. Our choice of words is limited. This is why kids learn all the swear words from their parents in stressful situations. I love the shirt that says, I'm not responsible for what I said when I was docking the boat. My kids learned some things as my dad docked our boat. So if you feel bad for what you say when you're stressed, your nervous system was worried more about keeping you alive than you being a good example. If you know people, maybe you have a child, maybe it's you yourself, you're always on edge, have high anxiety, live in a bubble of stress around you, this is because you or their nervous system is always sensing danger. And maybe you or these people have lived most of your life in the red, in this hyper-aroused zone. Now, if someone comes up behind us and scares us, We're mobilized. We automatically might hold out our arms to protect ourselves. Our heartbeat elevates to get us to run away or fight. Then if we see it's a friendly person, we say, oh, you scared me. This happens to all of us. Now notice when that happens next. I want you to pay attention to how you feel so you can map your nervous system responses. These are normal, healthy responses. The key is to be able to assess Is this an accurate state? Do I want to be in the red? Or can I safely go back to green? And I'm going to give you more tips on how to do that in a moment. And even more in future episodes. There is another state which our nervous system might assign us to. This is the gray zone or what the polyvagal theory calls the dorsal zone. This is what we refer to as the freeze response. Remember, our nervous system wants to conserve energy. So if we've been in a hyper-aroused state for a long time, our body will shut down and move into freeze, which requires much less energy. When we're in the gray or free zone, we feel low. We feel hopeless. This is where we go when we get burned out. This is the zone of depression and sadness. 
Again, when we're in the gray, we don't have access to our prefrontal cortex. We often refer to the red and gray zones of fight, flight, and freeze as states of emotional dysregulation and the green zone of resilience as a state of emotional regulation. It's important to note that these zones, they're not good or bad. They just are. In a normal day, we're going to encounter stress and feel red. We're going to move into the gray immobilization as we get closer to bedtime. The goal isn't to be in the green 100% of the time. The goal is to grow that green zone, grow our window of tolerance as much as we can, and know how to return to this zone. Last week, our neighborhood had a fireworks show that we all put off, and one inebriated man dropped a firework that shot, luckily, under the chair of another man. Everyone within sight automatically went into the red and mobilized with instant fear. As we quickly assessed that no damage was done, a healthy nervous system could then return to the green. We want to be flexible and resilient. When there is real danger, as there could have been that night, we want the tools available in the sympathetic nervous system or the red zone. We want the extra cortisol and energy and mobilization. And because of the healing and health benefits of good sleep, We want to know how to relax and move into the gray. So a healthy nervous system can move between colors and states as necessary. As a coach, I'm always assessing, can I use mindset tools or do I need nervous system tools with a client? Think of the same as you interact with your family. Get to know your responses, your zones, and also assess what color your child is in. If they are in the red or gray, It isn't a good time to ask them what they're thinking about a situation. They aren't in that zone. They're just responding. They aren't thinking. Notice how wide your green safety zone is. Are you often triggered? Or can you remain calm in a variety of situations? Do you feel safe more often than danger? If we did endure several adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, or traumas, it's common to have a very narrow zone of safety, a narrow green bandwidth. One way our body responds when we have a very narrow zone of green or safety is with disease, chronic conditions, depression. This is our body trying to protect us and tell us something is wrong. Maybe calm feels uncomfortable because it doesn't feel like home because we're only comfortable being busy and living in stress and chaos. The key is to get an accurate picture and mapping of your zones your triggers, and when you leave the green zone. Several years ago, one of our sons was in a horrible car accident and I went to the scene to get him. Thank heavens he was okay, but it was a very traumatic experience. My body was activated for probably 72 hours. I stayed very in the red. I could feel it and I wanted to honor what was naturally happening. It was a very appropriate response. I didn't go to social events. I kept him home from school. I didn't make big life important decisions. I honored the real danger we felt and compassionately helped my body process and stay where it needed to be until it had released those feelings. I've noticed there are certain ways my kids talk to me or things they say that trigger me into the red. And in these cases, I can quickly return to the green. So how do we return to the green? I love how Deb Dana, a nervous system expert teaches to anchor back in safety, to have metaphorical anchors in the green zone. These anchors allow us to go into the red or gray and give us a path back to the calm and safety of the green. Everyone may have individual anchors, but overall these anchors include breath work, breathing techniques, social connections, exercise and movement, getting daylight, good nutrition, Meditation, I love the Calm and Headspace apps. Both have free versions. We want to grow our green zone slowly, just like moving to a new home takes time to become comfortable and known. This new calm home may take time to feel comfortable since it's new. One way I've had to do this is by learning to be a good guest, relax, and enjoy a dinner party or event when my default often is to be a busy hostess and be a doer. 
my nervous system wants me to know how to do both. There's a place for both. So I've consciously worked to grow my social green zone. We are all very much influenced by the nervous systems of people around us. This is called co-regulation if we use it to regulate to connection. Years ago, we were at a swimming hole in the Middle East, and as we swam into deeper waters, a father and child near us got into swimming trouble. It was obvious the child was in trouble and the dad couldn't help. Panic set in instantly, as it should for both. It's just that panic and being in the red is deadly in those situations. My brother, who had been a lifeguard when younger, was closest to them in the water, and he used a very calm tone of voice to try to co-regulate the child so they would grab onto the swim noodle he was offering them. My brother's ability to stay in the green was a tool to help keep the other person safe, hoping they would sense his calm and regulate down, which they did. I'm sure you've seen this with your children or with other people. Calm can be contagious, not always, but it can be because our nervous systems are always picking up on the cues of other people. I love how one of my mentors says our nervous system walks into a room before us. We are always giving off energy, telling people if we are anxious or calm. I'm sure you've known people with whom you go into high alert and are anxious and you aren't sure why. This is because our nervous system is picking up on anxious cues of danger from the other person. Pay attention to the people you are around when you can more easily move into the green. Who is calm and regulating for you? I just went on a trip with a friend, Aaron, and it was such a calm and engaging and connecting green zone trip, even when we almost missed our flight, which we haven't told our husbands about. I know who to call when I need help anchoring back in the green. Now, who is that person for you? I know I need to exercise every morning to move from the gray free state into my green zone of curiosity and connection. I need this every day. My husband and I walk every night after dinner for at least 30 minutes. We're just walking at a normal pace, but we're social. We're moving. We're processing and discussing the day. We feel connected and we then are ready for our body to shut down and rest at night. In decades to come, I think we're going to find pickleball will bring health and wellness to older generations because it incorporates many of the healthy green zone qualities of being social, connecting, and moving. An interesting quality of the gray zone is when we find ourselves here, we're going to need to add energy to our body. This is where co-regulation is very important. We may need a friend to be with us to allow us to remember our green social and connecting zone to reactivate our brains. Now, alternatively, when we're in the red zone, we may want less stimulation. We want to seek calm and take away energy. It's very good to have goals that are pushing us that introduce some stress So we practice expanding our zone and learning how to move back to green. I grew up camping for our family vacations. My dad often loved that we'd encounter problems and then we'd solve them as a family. He found success in going to the red and coming back to the green. I've learned some people like having problems and some people like solving problems. I think this is the difference between people who are more comfortable in the red or the green zones. Now pay attention to your teenager's nervous system states. After seeing what triggers my children, I can modulate some ways I interact with them to keep them calm. It doesn't always work, but often it does. And I'm going to talk you more through this in upcoming episodes about maybe when to connect with them and when not to. Sending our child to college is very activating. Our nervous system is going to sense danger all around. I know it did for me. I'm going to give you tools to honor the anxiety that you're going to naturally feel. We want to know what color and state we are in before we call them. Now, everything about the nervous system zones, these colors, they really color how we see the world. The color we are in creates stories about us, stories about our lives. The zone we are in determines if we feel like victims or heroes of our lives. In a gray zone, we're going to see the world as scarce, hopeless, No one likes me. Things never work out for me. 
The more we grow our green zone, we change the lens through which we see the world. We become heroes. We live in abundance. People start talking to us more because we show up in the world knowing people like us. We know everything will work out. I can myself move into the gray, and when I sense the energy change, I know I'm not at my best and to give myself some space to move back to the green. I also know I can be activated by people who are highly stressed and run at a higher chaos frequency. It isn't good for my nervous system. So I seek out calmer, more regulated people to be in my tribe. Knowing how your nervous system works, I hope is giving you permission to see these states and energies without judgment. Our nervous system isn't morally good or bad. We aren't better in any zone. We're responding to many learned patterns. Now that we know more, we do have more choice in how we regulate, but we didn't choose many past experiences that created our system. So be compassionate with yourself. Knowing what we know now, we can have curiosity and compassion as to why our kids are stressed or anxious versus judgment that they shouldn't be that way. Upcoming episodes will dive more into tools to handle situations, having boundaries, how to move between states, how to anchor back into your zone of tolerance, how to manage the normal stresses and anxieties as our children move out of the home, and how our feels and how our fears will activate our nervous system. So stay tuned and always reach out to me privately if you'd like a specific situation addressed in any episode. Be sure you have signed up for the free video series on how to not freak out when you are ghosted by your child. Sign up is on my website or the link in my Instagram profile. That's it for this week. If you would like to see how coaching can help you navigate children leaving home with less worry and more peace, sign up for a consult call at HeidiBenjaminson.com or DM me on social media. A confident mother is the greatest gift to her family, not a perfect mother. Our families want us to feel confident, anchored, and calm. I can help you uncover this version of yourself. Have a great week.